Morning, everybody. Thanks, everybody, and thank you, Rosenthal, for putting this together. So uh, thank you for being with us for this uh, morning panel on how to improve coverage of the climate crisis and avoid the don't look up scenario. Uh, Mallory has explained for those who don't watch every movie that's been released what it is. But uh, how many people here actually saw it? All right, so it's pretty, pretty good, pretty good, uh, pretty good representation here. I wanted so badly to love it. Um, but uh, Hollywood is still trying to figure out how to tell this story. Uh, and they're in a good crowd, because frankly, so are we as journalists, trying to figure out how to tell this story. Uh, I'm John Schwartz. I've spent 40 years in journalism, including a, a fair chunk on climate change. And uh, I'm also associate director of UT's Global Sustainability Leadership Institute, which prepares Longhorns for working in a business world that cares more and more about these issues. Some of our state officials might disagree, but if they want to fire me, I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> and as I said, I'm a science writer, and I used to think that writing about climate change was largely about laying out the facts. I've learned a lot since then. The problem of climate change isn't something you can deal with half-assedly. Rosenthal, can I say half-assedly? Is that okay? I already said it, right? Um, it takes commitment from reporters who have to climb a tough learning curve and from institutions that have to fund them. We're very lucky to have four amazing people to talk with you today, three journalists and an expert on energy and climate. Manuel Andreone is a New York Times climate reporter based in Brazil, along with some amazing stories, which she'll be talking about. She's an author of the NYT's Climate Forward newsletter. She is a fellow at the Rainforest Investigation Network covering the Brazilian Amazon. She studied at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and received a master's degree from Columbia University. Daryl Fears covers environmental justice, a new beat at the Washington Post, where he's worked for nearly 25 years. He led a series of stories in 2021 that were recognized as Pulitzer finalists and also a member of the team that won a Pulitzer for a 2019 investigative series on global hotspots created by accelerated climate change. He's currently a Harvard Neiman Fellow, trying not to dwell on the fact that his time there is ending. <laughs> Vernon Loeb became executive editor at Inside Climate News after a 40-year newspaper career that included stops at the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and Houston Chronicle. As Evan said, there is always a Texas angle. <laughs> During his last stop as managing editor of the Chronicle from 2014 to 2018, he was fully invested in saving newspapers and never thought much about nonprofit news. Now that he's running a nonprofit newsroom, he thinks the nonprofit sector has an important role to play in the new ecosystem and still thinks newspapers are among the nation's most important civic institutions. Dr. Michael E. Weber is the Josie Centennial Professor in Energy Resources in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin and CTO of Energy Impact Partners, a $3 billion with a B clean tech venture fund. Weber's expertise spans research and education as at the convergence of engineering, policy, and commercialization on topics related to innovation, energy, and the environment. His book, Power Trip, The Story of Energy, which I did love, was published in 2019 by Basic Books with an award-winning six-part companion series that aimed on PBS, Amazon Prime, and Apple TV starting Earth Day 2020. Thanks for being here, y'all. Each of you has a brief presentation worked up, and then I'll ask questions, and then we're going to open it up to questions from our crowd. Uh, when it's time for questions, everybody, please ask, you know, actual questions. Uh, we don't have time for statements or lengthy manifestos. Um, all right, let's start with you, Manuela. Hi, everyone. I'm very uh, happy and honored to share uh, this panel with all these wonderful people. I have a quick presentation about 
some of the strategies I've used to um, help readers uh, understand and uh, climate change and the biodiversity crisis, the other uh, crisis threatening humanity that we don't talk about that much. Um, so, uh, yeah. So my first strategy is uh, bring it closer. Um, so a lot of the um, a lot of the causes um, of climate change and the biodiversity crisis are happening very far away from our readers, and it's really hard to help them understand how meaningful they are if they don't feel uh, very connected to it. Uh, so one strategy that I've used is using investigative journalism to help uh, readers connect with issues that are far away. Um, as um, John said, I covered the Amazon, Amazon rainforest in Brazil a bit, and that is an issue that uh, readers of uh, the New York Times don't feel very close to, so I use um, investigating supply chains to bring them a bit closer to it. And everyone uh, can do it. You know, I'm sharing some of the websites. If you uh, think about a product uh, that uh, people close to you are buying, uh, you can use these websites to try and understand how the trade flows work um, to connect uh, your readers to, to them. So we did this to talk about how uh, appetite for leather car seats in the U.S. is fueling uh, Amazon uh, deforestation. We connected um, uh, illegal deforestation uh, happening in um, protected areas in the Amazon. Cattle that was raised in these areas uh, then went to uh, um, meat packing companies that supply leather to major automakers that every reader uh, we uh, are writing to knows about, like GM. Uh, so we, in this way, we're able to connect issues that are far away uh, to our readers. Another um, strategy that I think is very cool is surprise people. Um, oftentimes, we are talking about uh, issues that uh, are very old, right? Like climate change um, and about diversity crisis. They are problems that kind of tend to repeat themselves because, hey, we haven't really addressed them uh, fully yet. So how do we talk about illegal mining in the Amazon, which is a problem that has been plaguing the forest for decades? Like, how do we... Uh, give it a fresh look. So we use satellite imagery to track, uh, to map unregistered airstrips, uh, illegal airstrips that fuel um, uh, illegal mining in the Amazon. Uh, we partner with the Rainforest Inves Investigations Network and the Intercept uh, to map all these airstrips and gave like a fresh look um, and you know help bring readers to the ground with us uh, using satellite imagery. Um, and the last strategy I want to talk about is something that yesterday a lot of um, a lot of uh, people talked about is make it personal. Uh, I really like it when uh, Catherine Hayhoe, the uh, from the Nature Conservancy, Conservancy, says that when we're talking about this these issues, we're not talking about saving the planet, right? We're talking the planet is going to keep taking turns around the sun. Uh, no matter what we do to it. We're talking about changing the planet in ways that are gonna make it inhabitable to us. So we're talking about saving us. So I think it's important to really connect with readers uh, in these, this very personal space of how things are changing in their own lives and how their own lives impact uh, these changes. Uh, and you know, I know that a lot of times uh, it's hard to read the comment sec session, section, and um, but the newsletter that we're writing now, Climate Forward, really helps us listen to readers uh, in, in, in different ways and try to incorporate uh, some of what they're saying um, in, in, our, in our newsletter. And readers have responded very well to that. They really like uh, reading uh, their own stories in the newsletter. That really helps them engage uh, with these issues. Um, and the newsletter also allows us to show that we reporters are human too, and we are also worried sometimes, and we're also feeling hopeful sometimes. And you know, showing that we're there, hum humans behind the screen, uh, I think helps people connect uh, with uh, with with the with the coverage um, a lot too. And that's it. Um, if you have ideas, please write to me. slide presentation. Um, 
I thought we were going to walk. First, let me thank uh, ISOJ for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to be among fellow journalists exploring new ways to fulfill our um, calling, which is telling the truth. Uh, I thought we were going to go up to the uh, podium, but oh. these chairs are so comfortable, I think I'm just going to stay and, yeah, and, no, and no, sit no, right that's, here. That's, that's fine, unless, unless you really want to be up there, in which case, it's your panel. You get to do it the way you want. Yeah, I feel comfortable right now here that's beautiful. with my, with my legs that. crossed. Um, and so, um, how to improve coverage of cli the climate crisis in five minutes. <laughs> We're living in this moment as though we're uh, on some gorgeous beach, feeling nerve trembling beneath us and asking, did you feel that? We look up and see that the shore has vanished, leaving marine animals to flop about as one of the greatest forces in nature gathers for an onslaught. And we're like, do you see that? When horse historians look back on our times, perhaps after the worst has happened, they just might ask, why didn't they see the signs? Why weren't they prepared? Why didn't they realize what was coming their way? The signs are some, some of the signs are these, half a world away in the Pacific Islands and not so far away in the Caribbean. The ocean is gradually climbing up the shores. California is currently experiencing unprecedented levels of precipitation after experiencing unprecedented levels of drought. Yes. Weird things happen in the desert, but there was a time when these weather cycles were more harmonious. The Colorado River, a major source of drinking water in the West, is drying. Last year, in the state next door, Louisiana, you could walk across the Mississippi River, dried as it was by rising heat. The warmest years on record and the hottest and deadliest fires, the largest and most frequent storms, have all happened in this young century. How should journalists tell this story to avoid the don't look up scenario, which turned another way, is the heads buried in the sand scenario. News leaders must understand that this is an hands, all hands on deck story. It is the defining story of our time. It is not a moment for simply writing a memo to the staff saying that climate change is going to be a stronger focus. It is a moment for bolder leadership, a time to gather every person in the newsroom for a heart-to-heart -heart discussion about how to comprehend and tell the story of an existential crisis better than how we're telling it. It requires reimagining our storytelling and who these storytellers will be. I'm not here to present my own newspaper as some kind of outlier, because it's not. But the Washington Post has taken important steps to meet this challenge. In 2019, the climate team found that climate change has created hot spots around the world where temperatures have far exceeded the dreaded tipping point for irreversible warming the scientists have warned about. We determined that revealing this truth required not only great reporting, and writing, but deep data-driven research, strong graphic arts, photography, sound, and editing that make stories more engaging for readers. The 12 climate stories that comprise 2C Beyond a Limit had near cinematic appeal. It was an award-winning project, but beyond that, it was a foundation upon which to build a new model for telling these stories. Good reporters and writers will always be essential but news organizations must recognize the value of artists, designers with skills to present long and short stories as though they were feature films. Maybe a little over the top, but we must help readers see the problem. How does an industry achieve this with diminishing resources? By reconsidering its current priorities. Is horse race journalism the scoop the day-to-day -day political story, the day-to-day -day business story, a model for the past? How much of that is really needed? After the 2C project, I was given an opportunity to cover what 
I might call the canary in the coal mine. It's another version of the climate story. A few words about the canary. Starting in 1911, for people who don't know what the canary is, coal miners stuck canaries in their workplace to determine if deadly gases were lurking. If the bird died, bad sign. I decided to pay close attention to America's climate change canaries, black, indigenous, Latino, various people of color, along with the poor, who are on the front lines of climate change and pollutions, and the canaries are not well. I cover the environmental, just, environmental justice movement, uh, people in the lowest lying areas, people who live near rail yards and power plants. These people are gonna be able to tell us what the future looks like for all of us, and we must pay very close attention to their stories. Uh, how did I end this? Uh, and we're only beginning to tell these stories. We need to make every effort to give them the time and attention they deserve. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, you know, when I covered uh, national security for the Washington Post like 25 years ago, um, I was engaged in this sort of uh, daily mano a mano combat with the New York Times. I used to dread walking to the end of my driveway and picking up a little newspaper bag and the, a little blue bag with the newspaper inside to see what the Times had and what I missed. Um, and I'm sure their, their reporters had the same experience. Um, I think if there's one thing that I'm enjoying about the nonprofit world uh, after 40 years in newspapers, um, it's it's seeing other journalists now, the ability to see other journalists now as collaborators and not competitors. Um, we, have a, we have a mantra, thank you. Uh, we have a mantra at Inside Climate News, we don't have competitors, we only have partners. And, um, and so, um, you know, now that we're uh, on the ground in Texas, which we're really excited about, um, we see that, I see that so clearly in the way the Texas Tribune operates. The Texas Tribune has internalized this ethos as well. They are a fantastic partner and they see us as a collaborator and not a competitor. And we, they publish a lot of our stories, not all of them, uh, but a, a lot of them, and we're really grateful for that. And then when they publish our story, that story goes out to Sewell can tell me, 35, I don't know how many newspapers in Texas, but uh, the Tribune has become like a, like a wire service for Texas. And so our stories not only appear on our site, they appear on the Tribune site, um, but newspapers all, all over the state. And, and you know, in my, years at news, in my years at newspapers, newspapers were not the most collaborative enterprises ever. They were paranoid, they built walls around their content, they didn't want anybody to know what they were doing. Um, but now I see even in newspapers, um, even competitive newspapers like, like uh, Daryl's and Manuela's are deeply into collaboration. I don't think they collaborate with each other yet, but maybe they'll get there. But, um, you know, collaboration is, you know, increasingly, uh, you know, the name, the name of the tune. And for climate change, it's so critical because climate change is... Uh, an enormous story. It's truly, it's the only story I've ever experienced in journalism that is truly global. There are no boundaries to it. It affects every town, every person, every town, every city, every nation um, in, in novel ways and sometimes similar ways. And so the need to collaborate on the story is extraordinary. And, and in the climate space, I think we're seeing that. There's covering climate now. We're part of a uh, consortium called the Climate Desk. Uh, we have, you know, we try to build partners all over the country. We have a great partnership here in Texas. So I think if there's one thing the nonprofit sector has really contributed, you know, in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years during its growth. I mean, when I, when I started in newspapers, there, there really weren't nonprofit news organizations. There was no need for them. Newspapers saturated the country and, and by and large, from TV and newspapers, that's where people got their news from. I think the, 
the numbers Joe Kahn or, or was it Evan used about the death of newspapers are, are really frightening. And, and, and like uh, John said, I love newspapers and I think newspapers continue to be in incredibly important civic institutions in their cities and towns. And one of the things we want to do is help newspapers and work with newspapers um, and, and help them you know, crack the digital code and sell digital subscriptions and cover climate change. Um, this weekend, uh, to give you a sense of how this is playing out, so this weekend we're publishing a piece um, that, we, that you know, we spent a lot of money on, a lot of time on, on the coming uh, produced water, waste, oil field wastewater disposal crisis in Pennsylvania. You know, fracking in Pennsylvania, number two only to Texas, creates huge amounts of uh, really toxic wastewater. And the state really has no strategy and no wherewithal at this point to deal with it, to dispose of this waste. Much of its waste had been going to, much of this water had been going to Ohio, and Ohio has basically said, enough, we don't want Pennsylvania's water anymore. Like, take care of your own wastewater. So we've, we've got a big story running on our site uh, tomorrow. Uh, hopefully it's also going to run in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. It's also going to run on a newspaper consortium in uh, Pennsylvania called Spotlight. And it's going to run, I hope, on a um, public radio consortium in um, Pennsylvania called Statewide Impact. None of these uh, entities existed. 10, 15 years ago. Everybody was in their silo and competing with each other, and now suddenly there's this, there's this, you know, there's this sharing, there's this collaboration, and I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, if anything is going to help uh, make up for the loss of all of those local reporters, what was it, a quarter of news, newsroom personnel are now, are, are now gone or laid off, if anything is going to help um, make up for that loss of, of really deep, meaningful information at the local level, um, you know, it's going to be this kind of ethos of collaboration. Um, Inside Climate News started uh, 15 years ago to fill, it started as a two-person blog, and it, it, to fill gaps in climate coverage. Like, nobody was covering climate. I mean, you know, my publisher, David Sassoon, realized there was this, you know, existential crisis that nobody was writing about. Um, well, that's changed. You're like, People are writing about it now. A lot of people are writing about it. Um, um, the coverage is, is you could, in some ways, is even like saturation. And yet, uh, the consciousness is not there. Um, uh, there's a, I, I feel every day this enormous sense of urgency related to this story. Um, you know, we're eight years after Paris, uh, and uh, carbon emissions have yet to go down. In fact, they not only haven't gone down, they go up every year by a lot, <laughs> with the possible exception of the pandemic year. Um, you know, the, the signs are all around us. The urgency is, is, again, I feel it like more and more every day. I don't know if anybody caught the Al Gore, some people called it a rant, but I, I thought it was a, a great a presentation at Davos where he just went off and talked about how serious this crisis is. So I, again, the need for this collaboration is, is I think, uh, more intense than ever. And so uh, um, we're still trying to fill gaps, but now in a different way. We're trying to fill the regional gaps that exist in these areas where there are no newspapers anymore, in the, in the areas where these 70 million Americans live, as someone said earlier. With, with one or no sources of information. So increasingly, you know, we're, we're filling these regional gaps. And um, uh, I think, you know, what, what's, what we really have to confront, and I think, you know, Daryl alluded to this is, this, is this complacency at all levels, individual, local, regional, national, global, about climate change and about what's really what we're really confronted with and how urgent the situation is. And so, you know, uh, we're all in this together, and I, I believe incredibly strongly in the power of journalism and the power of truth. You know, a, a lot of our, our, our funders like to fund activists and advocates, and, and we write about them and we cover them, but our, our point in, in, in those uh, discussions is always there's a power to journalism that's um, unique, that's undeniable, that, that powers the activists and the advocates and we're a critical part of the solution. If, if we're, if we're going to stave off this crisis, 
I think the, the journalist contribution is going to be enormous. And so um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be in nonprofit news these days. I, I think these discussions that are really going on here about how we build this new uh, news um, you know, ecosystem is so important. And as is you know, uh, a commitment that I think Joe Kahn expressed really well to the fundamentals of you know, call it objectivity, call it deep reporting, however you want to describe it, the fundamental commitment to truth and deep reporting and, and reporting facts and, and true things that matter, as especially related to the climate. So good to see you. I'm an engineer, so one of this is not like the others, but it's good to be here. And I uh, am a consumer of climate journalism, and sometimes I'm an expert quota for it, sometimes I write op-eds, so I'm engaged in this universe as an engineer. And I'll make a couple comments. One is the quality and quantity of climate reporting has improved so dramatically over the last 15 years. I think that we need to stop and recognize that we're actually headed a very good direction, and things are so much better than they were before. There are a lot of reporters who've been on the beat for quite some time, so they developed a lot of expertise and very extensive view on this. Many more newspapers cover it. The placement of the coverage is now more front and center than it was before. I think it's really fantastic. I, I organized a panel in 2012, so 11 years ago, on France and USA and competing views about climate change, and David Sassoon was on the panel, and Russell Gold, then the Wall Street Journal, Ernie Moniz was our keynote speaker, and a month later, Ernie was announced as Secretary of Energy, and David got the Pulitzer a couple months later. So I, no guarantees that will happen on this panel, but I just wanted to say that there, that was sort of a sign that climate news had, yeah, we'll go for it, we'll do it again. So climate news has come a long way. That was before, you know, I feel like we were looking for these articles, and now we can find them many places. And the nuances there, which I really appreciate. A couple things I would recommend or think are opportunities for improvement you know, Manuela kind of hinted at this, there's room for hope, I think. And a lot of the doom and gloom of like, we're all gonna die and our uh, oceans are rising and there's salt water intrusion and acidification and everything else. There's a lot of reason for concern, there's a lot of reason for urgency. This is, I think, the most pressing, important global crisis for the century. Although I'm starting to worry about the rise of autocracy as a competing contention for that. In fact, if we can defend democracy, we could probably solve climate change more easily. So these are related, perhaps. And so this is the issue, but there's actually a lot of reason for optimism. And weirdly, in Texas, there's more reason for optimism than almost anywhere, which is bizarre, and I'll explain in just a second. So first of all, as an engineer, I'm an optimist. Uh, the definition of an engineer is problem solver, and I think to be a problem solver, you have to believe the problem can be solved. And so engineers are kind of wired to be optimists. We can solve a problem. Now the bad news of being an optimist is we're constantly disappointed when the problem isn't solved. And I often wonder if it'd be better to be a pessimist, because then you're often pleasantly surprised when things work out. But I, oh, we can argue about that later. But I, there are ways to solve problems. And there's no hotter spot for climate denialism than Texas, just about. Uh, Governor Perry said that if we tackle climate change, we have to regulate human breath and that it's a Chinese hoax. And then he went on to run energy policy for America for a while, right? Governor Abbott has said, we're not touching climate change. Texas is decarbonizing faster than any other state in America and faster than any other country in the world, except for perhaps England. And so that's kind of fascinating that we don't even accept the science. We think it's ridiculous, yet we are doing it. And New York and France and other countries that have really sort of accepted and understand the science are not doing it. And so that's cause for optimism because it's a sign that the reasons Texas are doing it have nothing to do with climate science. We often do the right things for all the wrong reasons. It's very typical in Texas. But it's just cheaper. Like the solutions are just cheaper. Wind and solar are cheaper than the other options. And we see benefits on air quality or avoided water use for cooling power plants, that kind of thing. And so if denying Texas can do it, then certainly the rest of the world can as well. So that gives me a reason for optimism. Other reasons for optimism, I've got the honor and privilege to have taught over 2,000 engineering students in my classroom in the last 15 years, plus another 1,000 professionals through executive ed, continuing ed, professional education, plus another tens of thousands of students through a MOOC, a massive open online course on energy and climate. And these students are committed, and they are taking positions of power. They are now, some of them, in their upper 30s or their 40s. They are in decision-making positions at companies. And these companies who wish to recruit and retain people have to have a net zero statement or a climate statement. These same companies, if they want investment, a third of the world is ESG capital. I know ESG is now a loaded term, the environmental social governance money, but like a third of the capital out there has investment criteria related to climate change of some sort. 
and the customers are starting to demand it. So if you look at the market forces of employees, investors, and customers, if you look at what the students want in the classroom, if you look at the actions of Texas despite it all, there's a lot of reasons for optimism. And I feel like the optimism sometimes is missing, which is not only can we solve this, but in some places we are despite all odds. And as you solve it, you save money and all these other things. We had a couple reports come out of my group over the last few months about all the money renewables have saved consumers in Texas. And it's in the billions of dollars per year. And sometimes if natural gas prices are high, it's like a billion dollars a month sometimes in, that, in Texas. And then all the water that's saved, all the air quality that has been approved, that kind of thing. So there's reasons for optimism. And I think that's missing, which is we gotta take urgent action because the bad news is bad and we need to avoid the bad news. But look at all the good stuff we get if we take action. It leads to more jobs and better jobs and cleaner everything better equity with how we access energy and better equity with who suffers the air pollution and everything else in the fence line community. So this is the good news that's missing. I think there's room for it alongside with the bad news. Uh, another couple things about this, I think we can look at complex problems that we've solved before in the United States. I'm thinking of like traffic fatalities in the 1980s. We used to have over 50,000, like 55,000 traffic fatalities a year in the United States in the 80s. We're now down to like 30,000. Our fatalities have dropped despite the number of people and vehicle miles travel going up like 50%. And this was a complex problem, but we solved it with a lot of solutions. Uh, better airbags, crumple zones, anti-lock braking systems, a third brake light, better striping, better speed limit rules, better drunk driving enforcement rules, comprehensive driver's education. A lot of things happen to make traffic fatalities better, and it's worked. And that's usually the way it is for most complex problems. There's not a solution. And people often ask me, what's your favorite? Is it wind or whatever? There's like one thing. It's going to be a suite of options, each of which improves the situation by a percent or so, but if you do enough of them, you get a lot of progress. And uh, I, th I think we'll have to use that also for the opioid crisis or wherever the crisis are, we'll need a lot of solutions. And that's something to keep in mind. I feel like oftentimes our narrative, which might be political or it's personal interest, is driven by one thing or another. And another aspect that's often missing from the coverage, which I think warrants more, is the cost of doing nothing, which kind of tips into the despair, like, oh, it's gonna cost this much to tackle climate change in the trillions or tens of trillions. I think it's gonna be tens of trillions to tackle climate change. I think it's gonna be hundreds of trillions not to tackle it. And for me, it's a lot cheaper to take action than not. And we have evidence of that already in so many ways. This report I just told you about we did in Texas, taking action on climate change, even though we didn't do it for climate change, has saved consumers money, made money for local governments, made money for landowners, building wind farms, this kind of thing. And so the cost of doing nothing is often left out. And actually the cost of the damages of CO2 is left out. So the false narrative is do we want to protect the economy, or protect the environment? And of course we want to do both. This is a false choice. It's not your false choice. It's put forward by politicians or, or stakeholders, but it comes out that way in the news sometimes. And what happens is we're leaving out the cost of the CO2 pollution. Uh, coal looks cheaper just because its damages are on a different column in the ledger. And we leave that out, that the cost of coal pollution is significant on biodiversity loss or acid rain or greenhouse gases, everything else, the land loss, you name it. And we leave out those prices. So the conventional options look expensive or look cheap only because we're ignoring a lot of the costs that are somewhere else. We're, we're not paying for it in the rates, we're paying for it in our taxes or lost economic activity. So I think it's actually really good coverage, it, and it's improved so much over the last 15 years. I've read all of your work at one point or another, and I think it's really remarkable, and we should sort of celebrate that. And then there's just some missing things about the complexity of what solutions look like, the cost of doing nothing, and the benefits of the optimism, like it's actually gonna take us to a better place. It's not just that we need to take action so that people don't die, but we'll get some economic growth out of it. So thanks so much for having me on the panel. I'm glad to be here, part of the conversation. <laughs>
but it only generates electricity like a third of the year, so the number of megawatt hours it generates is different than, say, a 100 megawatt gas plant. So this can show up as consequential in reporting one way or another. The other one is, uh, in terms of a technical mistake, is there'll be tons of CO2 reported, and it's not clarified as English tons or metric tons, and there's a 10% difference, which can make a difference. But also, there's tons of CO2, tons of CO2 equivalent, or tons of carbon, and these are all very different. So there are some technical things that can get missed, which actually have consequences, especially when we think about methane and methane leaks and carbon dioxide equivalents, which will show up. But for the most part, I'm just kind of picking at the edges. It's pretty good. I would say the main things left out are the complexity of the solution set. There's no one solution. There might be many solutions, and the solutions might be different in Florida than Texas or wherever. But also the cost of doing nothing, as i just repeating what I said, but also the cost of the conventional options. And so I, I have my hackles go up to me and see a story like, the new things that are cleaner are more expensive than the conventional ones, like, and that is not true. It only looks more expensive because we leave out all the damages. And so more comprehensive is a sort of honesty about, well, here's the damage of the current system, and including that, and that's missing from a lot of the reports. Okay. Uh, Vernon, um, you have talked with me about your sort of uh, holy crap moment with, with climate change and sort of what led you to devote yourself to covering climate change now after so many other beats. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so um, August 2017, uh, I woke up one morning, and the city where I lived, Houston, Texas, was underwater, like the entire city. Uh, Harvey dumped 51 inches of rain on Houston in two days. Uh, the city flooded massively, and um, it revealed all sorts of things about the city. and and. Um, to me, revealed all sorts of things about climate change. And I wrote an op-ed piece that week for the Washington Post where I made that point and said, you know, at least uh, some of what um, Houston is trying to deal with right now is from climate change. And you wouldn't believe the howl of uh, pushback I got and the outrage from people the Post got uh, in, in response to this column, uh, you know, Climate change is nonsense. It's just, it's not about climate. There's been flooding there before, on and on. Um, I don't think uh, if I wrote that same column today, the reaction would be the same. And I think it's uh, some of the progress you're talking about. Um, I, I, I think there's been a huge shift in consciousness uh, since 2017. So six, almost six years later, I think climate change is much more front and center in people's uh, minds and awareness. Um, and I think that's a sign that it's not all hopeless. I, I, I tend to be sort of a climate doomer myself. I spend so much time editing stories with these really troubling uh, science in them and, and research in them that I, that I just, I'm almost like suffering from climate PTSD. But I do think there's a lot of uh, positive things to focus on. Renewables leading the way, obviously. And I think people's, the, the public awareness is part of it. I mean, I, it's, polls show that a, a, a large majority of Americans think we should be doing more about climate change. But that's it. We should be doing more. We should be doing a whole lot more that we're not now doing. And, you know, so that's where the journalism comes in. Great. Uh, Daryl, you've, you've started this beat on climate equity issues at the, at the Post, and, and you've been working on it. And you've also done great reporting on how Historically, the climate movement has been so overwhelmingly white. Um, how, do we, how do we move forward and cover the people who, uh, who are being hit hardest? Uh, and, and as a subset of that, how do we do it in a way that shows them as a people as opposed to victims? Because there's a lot of just misery porn out there, right? Mm -hmm. um. Uh, the way to move forward is to, uh, we have to look at how money is distributed between these groups. So uh, environmental justice organizations, I, I'll just start from um, when I started covering climate. Um, of course, I uh, visited a lot of NGOs, and I went to their conferences, and I was struck by the fact that I was the only black person in the room, and in many cases, the only person of color in the room. And I wonder how this could be. I, I just knew that there were more uh, black people especially interested in the environment, and certainly people of color interested in the environment. And so I started to pursue uh, stories along those lines. And what I found ultimately is that 
philanthropists really favored uh, white-led organizations that were focusing on um, polar bears and seals and wolves and, and, and stuff like that. And, um, uh, and black people who did venture into the environmental space were having a lot of trouble uh, with the organizers of those organizations. Meanwhile, uh, environmental justice groups were completely underfunded, uh, just completely anemic in their fundings, uh, so uh, poorly funded that they couldn't afford CFOs. And it, when you don't have a CFO, when you don't have uh, some type of uh, finance officers, then philanthropists use that as a reason to not fund you. Uh, so that was a very interesting. And, and so I think that to move forward to sort of balance this out, you have to st tell the story of the history of how this happened. Uh, and you have to tell that story uh, truthfully, as elegantly as you can, uh, so that people can recognize themselves uh, in your coverage and, and understand that you are absolutely trying to tell their story so they, they can engage with you, with you more. Um, uh, about that story. Is that an answer to the question? That's perfect, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Manuela, the car upholstery story was so important to me uh, because, first of all, it introduced me to the term cattle laundering, um, which is one of the great phrases of our age, uh, hiding, hiding the origins of the, of the cattle uh, that are being taken from deforested lands. and, and letting companies that have made pledges of uh, doing things right sort of slide by. Um, but it also did the thing that we've been talking about, which is making climate change not something far away and in the future, but very personal. You are destroying the Amazon. The climate change is under your butt in your Escalade. Uh, and, and so, you know, that, that there's a re personal responsibility for climate change there. In, in the things that we use in our daily lives. Uh, Rosenthal, is it okay for me to say under your butt? Is that okay? Okay. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so, but that story was also something of an adventure. And, you know, this wasn't, you talk about the databases and the bills of lading and all that, but, but uh, you took some risks. And could you talk about those a little bit? Yeah, um, we, I think reporting uh, in the Amazon uh, in a lot of uh, forests is uh, very complicated because of the dangers to ourselves and to our sources. Uh, these are often lawless places. We have to remember that last year Dom Phillips and Bruno Pereira were murdered uh, because of what they were doing. Um, and we try to be uh, very careful about that um, and really assess the risks um, and really uh, talk through uh, our stories with our sources so they understand uh, what they're getting into uh, when they're talking to us and make sure that that's what they want to do. Um, and the so for that story, we had to follow a truck with illegal cattle, uh, cattle raised in illegally deforested land uh, to a major slaughterhouse, and that was uh, quite, uh, quite something. Like, we were actually invited to uh, see this guy who has, uh, who has defor illegally deforested, like, a like hundreds of acres of uh, forest to sell cattle uh, to, uh, to a major uh, uh, slaughterhouse. And I remember when I realized what was happening, I hid behind the car and was like, to the photographers, like, photograph this fate, his face. Um, because I just, you know, I wanted to communicate what we were seeing there without, like, um, making, uh, making him realize what, what, um, what was happening. Of course, I, I did tell, like, we're investigating the supply chain, but he was, they, these people, like, they're so used to the lawlessness that um, that they they don't they don't really uh, often don't really care about talking ha about how they defraud documents uh, to sell uh, cattle to um, major companies and so yeah we we followed the truck through the night uh, and I you know had uh, drink uh, and had to stay like in front of a slaughterhouse waiting for uh, the truck to go in and then for the 
leather hides to come out. Um, we were threatened, like when he, when the cattle, uh, when the farmer realized uh, that maybe that was bad for him. Like he said, oh, maybe you have, might have trouble here. So we packed our things and quickly left. Um, but, you know, I was most concerned about our driver who lives there. And I, I told him that, you know, he should stay in the car and pretend that he doesn't really, didn't really know what we were doing because I think that's, um, you know, we, we leave. Um, and so it's much safer for us to do these things, which really increases our responsibility to do it. Um, because a lot of the time, local people can't um, because they'll be, they'll suffer the consequences in their lives. Um, so, yeah. And that's, that's what the Post Center for... Uh, I, microphone, John. Oh. And, and, that's, and that's part of the importance, I'm sorry. That's part of the importance of the Pulitzer Center's funding of the Rainforest Investigations Network and the uh, Rainforest Journalism Fund is all about, is getting people to, to do that coverage. Yeah, absolutely. Like Vernon said, I think collaboration is, is the future. Like it really, um, I mean, is, is, is something that we should invest a lot more in. Like the global um, quality of, of what we're seeing really takes um, local knowledge and uh, global knowledge uh, to um, come together. And, you know, the airstrip story as well, like I partnered with uh, another Brazilian uh, reporter um, for that, uh, and I think you know we should be doing more of that because we don't know everything, um, and sometimes um, uh, and local journalists also need our protection. You know, like they need to be associated with big names, and that kind of helps protect what they're doing um, and and bring legitimacy to the work uh, that they deserve. Absolutely. So here's a question for everybody to answer. Uh, just real quickly, solve this problem. Um, which is what can we do about disinformation? Uh, it's hard to tell the truth when there are people who are paid to undermine it. Should we move to, uh, okay. And so uh, I, I always tell my students that climate coverage has led the way on this, that you can't both sides whether the climate is changing. You can't, you can't really both sides whether humans are generating the CO2 that's, that's pushing the process. Uh, at the NYT, no editor told us to go to the Heartland Institute and get a comment that really climate change isn't happening. Uh, we were told to, to uh, absolutely cover any legitimate conflict, like what's the role of natural gas in the, in the ongoing grid? What's the role of nuclear? There are, there are many sides to those questions. But, uh, but we got past the, the questions that a lot of political reporting is still caught up in. Uh, and so, um, what can journalism do? And I'm asking you, Michael, also to, to, uh, to do that. But you know, what can journalism do to address this? And, uh, and, and what can other parts of the newsroom learn from what we're doing? So I'll say as an engineer that I think we have a crisis in critical thinking in the United States, which is because we don't have enough liberal arts education. And I think that is fundamentally the problem. And I'm an engineer through through. I love STEM. I'm, I was raised an engineer. My father was a professor of chemistry here at UT, so I grew up on campus. Uh, we are a STEM family. And there has been a focus on STEM education essentially since World War II, but even more so the last few decades. So the liberal arts departments on campus is not growing, stagnating, it's shrinking. And the STEM parts of campuses are growing. So we have a lot of analytical thinkers now, but we don't have as many critical thinkers. And I think this is a real problem. And critical thinking is where you distinguish fact from fiction. Analytical thinking is where you figure out which equations to use to solve a problem. But the critical thinker helps you figure out which problem to solve. And I think we need both. So there's like the push from STEM to STEAM. You have the A for liberal arts or maybe even fine arts for creative thinking. And I would say as an engineer, we need more critical thinkers. And we need engineers to think critically. And we don't teach that for the most part. Or the students who are in engineering place out of it and don't take the classes. And so there might be nothing you can do on your side. The problem might not be on your side. It might be in the readership. And I'll, I'll sort of think back fondly. I was getting my PhD at Stanford in the 90s when the internet came to life. And we're like, oh, the internet's coming to life. We're going to have access to all the information in the world. We're going to be smarter. And it didn't help. There's just more information. We lost our ability to sort of uh, filter it appropriately. And we also, I would say, went from broadcasting to narrowcasting, where instead of having three or four channels ahead, the trusted source information we now can slice and dice whatever you want to reinforce it. So I, I think there's, it's really not a journalism problem, so to speak. I don't think the problem's from you. I think it's on the readership side, and it's a more systemic, frankly. Um, no, I just, 
I just wanted to say that, you know, it's really hard, like when we were uh, through in the Bolsonaro administration, it was really hard to, uh, you know, represent the government side without um, actually giving a platform to lies. Um, and I think we need to get better at giving them, like, the right to, you know, defend themselves, but in the story, challenging uh, what they're saying. We have to, you know, we can't stop at the quote. Uh, we can quote them and then um, really just tell the truth um, right next to it. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's a challenge and to find uh, the best way to do that. And we're still learning, um, but yeah. Um. In my experience, for a long time uh, at the Washington Post when I started covering uh, climate, you couldn't say uh, that some event was connected to climate change. You just had to report it out. And what happened was that the science got bolder, the scientists got bolder, and they started connecting um, heat events and other events to uh, climate change. And when you mentioned Bolsonaro, when uh, Donald Trump started to deny the science, uh, we could just rely on his own scientists and the federal government to contradict what he was saying. We could just pull their reports and say, uh, yeah, your scientists are saying this, and you're saying that, and uh, you don't look too good. And so um, you, can, you, you don't have to take any bold steps uh, because the scientists are doing it for you. Were you going to say something, or should we? No, I mean, I think the solution to climate change is collective. And I, I, Bill McKibben or somebody, some, you know, one of the climate activists I really admire said, someone asked him, well, what's the most important thing a person can do to solve the climate crisis? And he said, vote. And um, I, I think that's really true. But, you, you know, it begins with, you know, political systems that are enlightened in taking the kinds of action that need to be taken to solve this uh, crisis, uh, you know, so it's so it's a, it's accounted for us. It's accountability reporting and it's investigative reporting. It's finding the truth, explaining to people how climate's affecting their lives and who's responsible. Yeah, I just want to say also like that there's a lot of like really tough science involved. <laughs> like the climate change, it's really hard to understand. There's really a lot of bad science out there as well that gets reported sometimes and uh, it, we need to be really careful about that. A lot of misinformation actually starts with a really bad paper, right, that uh, someone picked up and, and, and covered. Um, and I think, you know, at the newsletter, I think we try to do that a lot, is just like really take the time to break it down and explain it in really simple terms. Well, and, and learn uh, the facts. I mean, and learn know, the facts. I mean, yeah. you know, what we don't want with climate change is the coffee science problem, where this study says coffee's bad for you, this study says coffee's good for you, and, and you end up with people thinking, well, the scientists don't know anything. In fact, the scientists know a lot, and the journalist's role is to find where the consensus is and, and, and still report on the latest science in context. I would say one more comment, if I may, is the presumption of the science as a starting point would probably help a lot. And I feel like I've been watching climate change coverage for decades, and a lot of it is, do you believe it or not? And I feel like we need to move past that. Instead, the question needs to be, what is your plan to deal with the climate crisis? Yeah. Like, let's, let's accept that there's a climate crisis, and then ask about your plan, rather than do you believe there's a climate crisis? That's kind of a free pass for disinformation. Yeah, and we, it should it, be the same thing with gun violence. What's your plan to solve gun violence? Let's not argue about whether gun violence is real. And so I think starting with the science and accepting that rather than giving a platform to deny it is probably a better spot. Yeah, at the, at the times we were talking in uh, 2016 about, okay, so it looks like Hillary Clinton is gonna win. We can stop talking about whether climate change is real. We can start talking about solutions, what people are doing, how government's moving forward. And then we ended up spending four years debunking again because, because you know, things happened. Uh, okay, we have questions from the audience. People should come up if they want to talk. I've got one uh, from online that I can start with, uh, which is um, reports and surveys show that people do not want to read the news because most of it is bad news and confuses and overwhelms them. Most climate change news isn't good news either. But the solutions journalism approach is trying to tell people's efforts to solve social problems. Do you think that solutions journalism can be an ally 
to capture the attention of audiences and get them interested in reading news about climate change. That's open to anyone who wants to. I have no idea, uh, frankly. But I would say um, it seems like negative news sells better than positive news. However, solutions-oriented thinking moves the economy faster. If people figure out, oh, I can make money doing that, okay, I'll do it, then you get action, that's the Texas story, right? So, um, so the solutions-oriented journalism might not change minds or get the clicks, but it might change actions. So I'm a believer in it. Our readers actually ask a lot. Like in the newsletter, they always ask, please tell us the good news. Please tell us what we can do. Uh, and it's hard as well because we can't say, yes, of course we can single-handedly solve this. Um, and uh, Samini always says, Samini Sengupta, my colleague uh, who writes the newsletter with me, always says that we have to be careful talking about solutions because you know, can't really solve it, can adapt, can mitigate. Um, but we can be very clear about what's happening and how people can engage. And I think we don't do that enough. And we don't uh, take as much reporting effort to report the solutions as we do the problems, right? Uh, we often feel like just um, we, you know, have to take them apart and show why they work and why they can scale um, in as with as much reporting effort as we do. Right. And solutions journalism is not about fixing the problem. It's about what people are doing to try to fix the problem, which is very complicated. And so, you know, it's not about it's not about something with a halo over it. It's not about something that's perfect. It's about what people are doing. You had a question. Yeah, um, my name's Keaton Peters. I'm a master's student uh, here at UT. I've mostly covered energy and, and climate. Um, had a very similar question to the one online, so I'll just kind of reframe it here. Um, do you think that there are times when the coverage of climate should scare people? And how do you balance times when you need to just be really clear-eyed about this is what's happening with times when you might want to creatively present solutions? Uh, yes, I, I strongly believe there are times when climate coverage should scare people and scare the hell out of people. Um, uh, I, I really feel like there's sort of this false dichotomy between uh, doomerism and solutions journalism. You know, it's a really complex question, and in every story that scares people, there are solutions. Like getting scared to some extent is a solution. I agree if people are. Um, you know, depressed and freaked out, it's hard to act and it's hard to get out of bed in the morning. Yeah, I think that's a real problem, but I also think it's a real problem if we start sort of dumbing down climate coverage to solutions. Um, I, you know, going for a solution involves under, having a very uh, complex and nuanced understanding of the threat of the issue and then what to do about it. So. I don't know if that answers your question, but I strongly, I, I really do believe that um, the truth is scary on climate change and we have to deal at the level of the truth. I would also say that fear is part of this coverage, but if you're framing it to make people scared, if, yeah, I'm, I'm just not a big fan of framing, I'm a big fan of telling the truth. Right. <laughs> the science itself can be scary. The engineering itself can be a amazingly positive. <laughs> and it's all part of this very kind of, you know, rich, broad, deep story. I wonder if I can comment on this as well. I always have something to say. That's the benefit of being a professor. We, we talk whether we know what we're talking about anyway. We just go for it. <laughs> so my anecdotal observation is that people under 30 are already scared. Frankly, they don't need to be scared. They're already motivated for action. Uh, I mean, like 80, 90% of younger people are ready to take action. And this reminds me a little bit of Winston Churchill when he said, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing, but only after they've exhausted every other possible option. <laughs> and he made that in reference to our late entry into World War I and World War II. It took us a long time to decide to take action. But eventually we got scared enough that there was enough on the line with our security or that our prosperity was at risk that we took action in World War I and World War II and the Cold War, and now we're doing it with climate change. So it's very typical of Americans to arrive late at the problem but then when they arrive late, throw a lot of money at it and move quickly. And I think that's happening with climate change in the last like nine months, a lot has happened on that. But fear is a big part of that. We weren't afraid enough for World War II that eventually we got scared enough, like wait, our national security is on the line and our opportunities for prosperity are on the line. Then it became less of a cost benefit analysis. Before there's like, well, it's expensive to get involved in a European land war, that kind of thing. What are the benefits for us? It moved from a cost benefit equation to one where we must win. We must win no matter what it costs. 
the Cold War, we didn't do a calculation on cost benefit. Eventually we said we must win. And I think we're starting to say that on climate change because of people who are your age and younger, like students are saying, we must win. It doesn't matter what it costs. So I think the fear is already there, frankly, for the rising generation, maybe not for the entrenched power right now. You had a question. Hi. <coughs> sorry, I'm too sorry. You've got my problem. <laughs> Hello, I'm Giovanna Girardi from Brazil. I'm a science and environmental journalist over there. And I'd like to ask you a question about this, uh, how important it is to, to have this interdisciplinary uh, look to the, to the situation. So I think we are, uh, the, the, the issue started being covered by science desk or environmental desks. And, and we, we realized that it's a, a more uh, wild, uh, wired, issue, so it has economic impacts and has political impacts and has um, habitational impact. So uh, I, I was wondering if you think uh, this can like help to, to, to reach more, more readers instead of just the ones that are usually to, to read this kind of stories. I think Bill McKibben said recently that for the rest of our lifetimes, every single major story be it cultural, political, economic, um, artistic, uh, medical, will play out on the stage of climate, um, which is the amazing thing about climate change, it touches everything. Uh, your health, your well-being, your property value, the, the nation's economy, and so on. So yes, an interdisciplinary approach is critical. Absolutely, the solutions require many disciplines to get us solved, and there's a saying that no one's more depressed than the atmospheric scientists except for the marine scientists, and no one's more depressed than them, except for the freshwater scientists. I mean, so you, it starts to touch every discipline, and so everyone has to be involved in the solution. Well, uh, Manuela, Daryl, Michael, Vernon, I cannot thank you enough uh, for making your way here, short commute for you, but, uh, but, but uh, for, for being here today and for sharing the word uh, with these folks on a Saturday morning. And thank all y'all. Thank you, Mallory, for the introduction. And, and thank y'all for being here with us.